Hello and welcome to this video about slab waveguides, also known as parallel plate waveguides. In this video, we'll learn how to analyse them using ray tracing techniques. This is different to using vector calculus. Even though it isn't as thorough as vector calculus, its great advantage is that it can be used to analyse waveguides that have very odd shapes, like triangles and pentagons. In this picture, we can see how the waves can propagate at various frequencies through the waveguide, in the Z direction. And this is the way that standing waves are produced in the X direction. We'll say that the vertical axis is in the direction of the X axis for now. We'll start off with this drawing of a ray of electromagnetic radiation propagating through this waveguide. This waveguide is a slab waveguide, so that its top and bottom are two very large flat plates that may be treated as infinite in all the horizontal directions. These two plates are a distance of A apart, so the width is equal to A. The ray propagates in one direction along the waveguide at an angle of theta as shown. It propagates at a distance of z along the waveguide when it bounces off one plate to meet the second plate. The total distance that the ray travels is d when it travels from one plate to another. The ray will travel at the speed of light, which is constant, so its propagation along the waveguide will be slower than the speed of light. This is what the ray of radiation looks like as a wave as it travels down the waveguide with troughs and crests. We can mark the crests of this wave with short orange lines that are perpendicular to the rays. The distance between these short lines is one wavelength. We can clean up this picture by only showing the wave crests and not the whole waves, so that the picture won't be so confusing. Now the main rule that we'll use is that all of the wave crests must line up with each other when the rays are travelling in the same direction. Lines drawn from one ray to another that are perpendicular to the rays must line up with the crests, this is so the waves constructively interfere with each other in the maximum amount. So looking at this diagram, we see that the distance that the energy travels along this ray from point A to point B must be an integer multiple of the wavelength, that is, the distance between the crests. In this case, it looks like this integer is equal to 7. This is what the diagram would look like when there are four wavelengths between A and B. And this is what it would look like for five wavelengths between A and B. Now we can get five equations from this diagram. To get an equation, to find the wavelength of the electromagnetic wave from the angle theta that it makes when contacting the walls of the waveguide and the width of the waveguide. The first equation is found from the right angle triangle relating these three variables. The next one is from the right angle triangle containing these three variables, and in particular this variable x. This equation relates the wavelength of the wave to the distance it travels between A and B. It has to be an integer multiple of the wavelength between A and B and this equation expresses this. The variable n is set to be an integer. This is the trigonometric ratio between the width of the waveguide and the distance the wave travels along the waveguide, z. And finally, this is another trigonometric ratio between the distance travelled along the ray and the distance travelled along the waveguide. So I'll just write these equations out again here, and make a lot of room for some mathematical derivations. We'll use this trigonometrical identity. We can substitute this trig identity into this equation, and so only cosine theta is now used everywhere. We can substitute this term in, so now there's only these length variables. 
we can manipulate this equation to be this. We can ignore the denominator of this fraction, and now only the numerator has to be zero. We can factorise this part of the equation. Now we can substitute the term containing an integer multiplied by the wavelength into this equation. Then we can manipulate it to be this equation that contains only multiplication and division. We can manipulate this equation to get it ready to make one more substitution. So after making this substitution, we get the cosine theta term back. And finally we get this equation for the wavelength, which may be manipulated to get the angle or the width of the waveguide as the subject. Continuing with these calculations, we'll write these equations out again at the top. This is the equation for the velocity of the electromagnetic wave travelling along the waveguide. It bounces back and forth from the top to the bottom at velocity c, which is the speed of light, so that it doesn't travel along the waveguide in a straight line, so that its velocity along the waveguide is reduced. We can make this substitution and get the velocity vg as a function of the angle theta. We can manipulate this equation to get theta as the subject of it. We can make this substitution to get this equation for vg in terms of only known variables. This equation simplifies to be this. Then we can manipulate it a bit more. And then finally we can get this equation to calculate vg in terms of these known variables. When the angle theta is made very small, then d and x will be very close to the width a, and to each other. The value of z will tend towards zero. This can be better seen in this diagram when theta is very small, like five degrees. So then, this equation will be true. When theta is zero, then lambda c is equal to the wavelength lambda of this electromagnetic wave. Lambda c is the longest wavelength of the wave that can propagate in this mode without being attenuated, or it is said to be the cutoff wavelength. It corresponds to the cutoff frequency. It is the wavelength of the wave at cutoff frequency measured outside the waveguide. We can use this equation to calculate the cutoff wavelength. When we make this substitution, we get this equation with a cosine zero term. Evaluating this equation gives us this. When we evaluate it for the TE or TM1 mode, we substitute n is equal to one into it to give us this simple equation. We can recall this equation that we derived earlier. When we evaluate it for the TM or TE1 mode, at n is equal to 1, we get this equation. And simplifying it gives us this equation. We can use this equation relating the cutoff radial frequency and the cutoff wavelength. Rearranging this equation gives us this equation for the cutoff radial frequency. I'll just clean up the screen and rewrite it again up here. After making this substitution, we get this expression. So this is the cutoff radial frequency of the waveguide for the first mode in terms of the plate separation distance A. We can use this equation to find the radial frequency for an arbitrary wave that's propagating in the first mode when n is equal to 1 and is larger than the cutoff radial frequency so that it can propagate. Rearranging this equation gives us this radial frequency as the subject of it. This is the formula that we've derived earlier for the wavelength of a wave propagating in the guide and reflecting off the walls with an angle theta. And this is what this wavelength is for the first mode.
or the fundamental mode of this waveguide when n is equal to 1. We can substitute these two equations one into the other to get the value of the radial frequency of this wave. So this is what the radial frequency of this wave is for the angle theta. We can get the ratio of these two radial frequencies by dividing these two expressions. To divide fractions, we flip the second one and multiply them together. And so we get this important equation for the ratios of these two radial frequencies. I could have used the frequencies F and FC, but textbooks usually like to use the radial frequencies, written as a small omega, which looks like a small w. So then I'll clear the screen and rewrite this equation at the top. This is the group velocity, which is the velocity of the energy of the wave in the waveguide that we calculated earlier. Now we've got to find it in terms of the ratios of the two different frequencies and show that it is the same as that found using vector calculus. We've derived this equation earlier from the geometry of the diagram. We can manipulate it using trigonometry. And then we can get this equation, which is the same as that derived using rigorous vector calculus methods. So the method of ray tracing worked, and it worked for the cutoff frequency too. We've derived this equation earlier. We can rearrange it to give us this ratio, which is the inverse of the ratio of the radial frequencies that we derived earlier. I could give some examples of how to use these formulas substituting values into them, but I'll leave this for another video. We could use these ray tracing methods to analyse other waveguides like triangular, rectangular and circular waveguides. So I hope that you have learnt something from this video and that it has helped you to understand this subject. Please click on like and subscribe if you like this video and leave all your thoughts, opinions and advice in the comments. Thank you for watching.